you glory, to most give you honor this year. We just are so grateful for all that you provide for us, Lord God. We ask, God, that you would bless the gift and the giver. And, and Father God, that you would multiply to meet every need. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Greet one another in the Lord and bring your tithes and offerings. It is? Yes, the worship team wants to come. We're going to get ready to worship the Lord. Amanda, come up. She's got something that the Lord gave her yesterday, and uh, it'll only take a minute, so you guys are in the right place. So, Do you want music underneath you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, come on. I want music underneath me all the time, so you can just stay up there. <laughs> Okay, I just got to find it. I wasn't totally prepared here. It's in one of my messages here. Okay. All right, I know you guys have read this verse probably thousands of times, or at least I hope you have. <laughs> yes, and um, listen to the words of this verse as you prepare to worship. It's in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 to 19. This is the ESV version, so it might be a little different than what you've read in the past. In thinking about the new year that we are now in, think about this verse. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. So everything that's happened this past year, or the last two years, like Rosella said, remember not those things. Let not your focus be on all the good stuff or the bad stuff. Let your focus be on what God wants to do right now in this new year. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So in this new year, if you're feeling like you're in the wilderness, if you're kind of floundering around, if you don't know what God's gonna do, if you're feeling like you're in the desert, I just wanna give you some hope this morning. I'm gonna read it one more time. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So God, I just want to thank you 
I want to thank you for the good things of last year, and I want to thank you for the bad things, because you were there. You were there in all of those things that happened. But God, we want to give you this new year. God, we want to say, behold, you're doing a new thing. So God, whatever that is in each of us individually, whatever that is at this church, Riverside, thank you, God, that you have new things this year. And I just pray, God, I pray for a joy in our hearts, God, that that joy would just take over everything else that's going on inside us. You give us a joy, God, for the new things of this year. God, you have new things for us. Let that be our focus, God, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, God, and with all our strength. And that means going about each day, God, with our focus on you, even though things happen each day that may be good or bad. God, let us have our minds set on you in this new year and what you want to do, which is that new thing. God, give us vision for that new thing that you have for us in our families, in our own hearts, and in this church, God. Thank you that you have new things for us, God. You're going to make a way in the wilderness, and you're going to make a way in the desert. God, you are right beside us, and you're going with us in this new year. Thank you, God. We love you. And now we set our hearts to worship you, God. And as we worship you today, God, renew our minds. Renew that strength in your presence, God. May we focus on you this morning and just give you our hearts, give you our soul, give you our strength and our minds. God, we are going to worship you now. We're going to set our hearts on you. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply call Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you I'm sorry, 
to refocus everything that we've been focused on and take it back and refocus it to you, Lord God. Lord, we come to you asking you to strip it all away till only you remain. We're coming to you in a place of remembering that the simplicity of life is focusing on you alone, Lord God. You are the purpose of all things, God. I come in simplicity
Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in Christ is Lord. I believe, I believe in you. I believe you rose again. I believe that Jesus Christ in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name. Of Jesus. There is a truth older than the There is a light that 
take a moment and we're just going to get right into the presence of the Lord as we uh, as we partake of communion this morning. I need a couple of brothers to come and pass out the emblems. Um, buddy, would you come? And Dan, maybe? Larry could help. Yeah, please. I pass it this way. Pass it across. Apparently dropped mine on the floor. That works out. I'm not so sure why my mic is so sensitive, but if you could cut it back just a little bit, I'll talk louder. have a reminder. It's so easy in this life to get distracted by the things of this world, the stuff going on around us all the time. And Jesus knew that we would need to take moments to be still and just know that he's God. And as we do this today, I just ask that you guys would take a moment to still your hearts, still your minds, and focus in on the work that was accomplished on the cross. You and I, each and every one of us, we were sinners, hopelessly lost. Every one of us has committed some sin before the Lord. Every one of us has either lied or stolen, murdered in our hearts, had an impure thought. Every one of us falls short of the glorious standard of God. And God looked down out of heaven and he saw our broken state. And he said, I'm going to make a way. And that way... It's through the blood and the broken body of my son. And so Jesus, on the night before he went to the cross, came before his disciples and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And when he said that, he knew that he would go 
to the cross. He knew that his body would be broken, would be crushed. He knew that he would wear a crown of thorns on his head. He knew that nails would pierce his hands and feet. He knew, he knew, and he knew he was doing it for you and he was doing it for me. And so he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And so as we take this bread together, we do remember the work of the cross. We do remember that you took our place, Lord. And we take it together and we remember in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He also knew that we would need a reminder of the purpose of it all. The blood that needed to be shed on Calvary's hill to redeem us, to make us new, to transform us, to heal us. He knew that he would be pierced for our transgressions, that he would be striped for our healing, and that the ultimate price would be paid. His life would be paid so that we could have new life. And so when he was gathered with his disciples, he says, whenever you take this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we do remember We do remember the blood that was shed. We remember the cat of nine tails that tore your body. We remember the nails that pierced your hands and feet. We remember what you did. But Father, more than that, we remember that you raised again so that we could have new life, that this would be a cup of a new covenant a covenant of grace, a covenant of mercy, a covenant of your love poured out for us. And Father, as we take it together, Lord, we take in that new covenant. We take in the cleansing of your blood. Once again, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse our hearts, O God. As we enter this new year, Father, turn our eyes and our hearts and our our very minds to you. As we take of the cup together, Lord God, we, we declare with one voice, Lord God, we are the body of Christ now. Use us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup together. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Okay, I think we're going to let the kids head on downstairs. Kimmy, at the end of my message, there are two video clips. I want to pull up the first one. Uh, We're going to do that before the message instead. That's the one. I don't know about you, but the last couple of years have kind of felt like this. Every day, every single day, It's just felt like we're constantly fighting a storm. There's a a pressure and a uh, a resistance against us that we are dealing with every day of our lives. And and you know what? The reality is, is that has always been the case. There's always been pressure and challenges 
and difficulty. And, uh, and, and today we're going to be starting a series on the miracles of Jesus. We're going to be looking at uh, the miracle uh, that happened when Jesus calmed the storm. And uh, that video clip that we uh, just watched was a, a video clip of a storm chaser that was trying to get out of the How about now? Okay, thank you. So all of the miracles and healings and signs that he performed had a purpose. And I, I want to challenge you to think about the miracles that Jesus did in a different way during this series. That the miracles that he did had a purpose that was different than just simply healing the sick or calming the storm. It was more than just the act itself. There's a deeper message. And so we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Sorry, I think I told you 25. My bad. We're going to look at verse 35. And we're going to read through to verse 41. And it says uh, in verse 35, That day when evening came, his he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waters broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the winds, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. 
And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would teach us today through your word. Father, that uh, our hearts would be open and that your spirit, uh, Father, would penetrate us today. Open our minds to who you are. Open our minds to who Jesus was. Open our minds to what Jesus was doing during this season in his life. We ask, Father, that you would change us from the inside out, transform us today like you did the disciples. Father God, fill us with, with the Holy Spirit and fire, I pray. And Father God, that you would help us, Lord God, to, to see the storm the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus performed miracles, and generally there are three main reasons why he did this. And, um, and so the first is the miracles that, of Jesus demonstrate and prove that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, that we should believe in Jesus. So John writes in chapter 20, verse 30, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this first uh, reason that we get this particular miracle, this particular thing that happens in
So, Jesus could have come to earth and healed no one. I want you to understand this. Jesus didn't have to heal anybody. He was not required. That was not part of what was needed to save the people. He could have come to earth, lived a a godly and and holy life, and died on a cross and, and, and let people know that he was the Messiah, and then raise again in three days and did nothing for us during his ministry, and that would have been enough. He didn't have to perform any miracles, except that his words said he would. But the sacrifice would have been enough. The sacrifice would have been enough. But he chose to heal the sick. He chose to deliver people from demons. He chose while he was here on this earth to show that he has compassion for the broken and for those that are in bondage. The recipient of the compassion was blessed to receive, but more so those that watched were given the testimony that God cares about you. That God cares about the weak, about the broken, about the sick, about the hurting, about the oppressed. God cares, even for the cripple and the leper. He modeled the compassion that he wanted to see in us. Jesus did these types of miracles so that we would believe that he was the Messiah, to confirm that the kingdom of God was at hand, and to demonstrate to us his love and compassion for mankind. But the first miracle of Jesus that we're going to study is this one from Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. And what's been going on here, give you the backstory. Jesus has been teaching and he's been ministering to large crowds all day long and uh, all throughout the day. And evening comes and Jesus decided to leave the crowds behind. And, um, and so several of them jumped into boats and they start heading across the Sea of Galilee. And during the trip, Jesus fell asleep. And um, this uh, event is a great reminder that Jesus was not just 100% God. He was also 100% man uh, because he needed to sleep. He worked hard all day, and he needed to sleep. He needed to rest. And, And in fact, he was so tired that a storm comes up on the ship, Waves are kicking over the side of the ship. Uh, people are scurrying and, and yelling and, and going about their, their business, just trying to keep things afloat. Probably there's guys with buckets bailing, and, and, and the waves are crashing over the side, and the winds are blowing, and Jesus is out. And I'll tell you, this is encouraging for me, because he knows what it is to be tired. And, and sometimes I get tired. Anybody else get tired? Guess what? Jesus understands what it is to be tired. He understands where you're at today. And, uh, and so he's going through this, and, and it says that there was a furious squall that came upon the ship. And, and this happens to this day over the Sea of Galilee. Uh, a storm will come over, suddenly come over the, cro- uh, the top of Mount Hermon, and then it will... It will, uh, it will drop right down onto the sea very, very quickly. And, w- and when that happens, the waves will pick up and the wind will blow. And, and, it, and if you're out on the water, especially if you're in, in days like that where there weren't motors and you're rowing, you know, or you're counting on the wind, this is a very dangerous place to be. Very, very dangerous and so the wind and the, the waves are, are hitting and crashing. And, and i got to tell you, I can relate to this situation. I can relate to this story. I can relate personally in the fact that there have been seasons and times in my life where I have been going about my business and I, I've been doing the work of the Lord. 
and, and something has come down off the mountain and hit me. And, and it wants to take me off my feet. It wants to drown me. It wants to, it wants to destroy me. And, and in those seasons, it can feel like, even though you have Jesus in the boat, it can feel like, hey, uh, God, uh, you got to wake up here. Something's going wrong. Anybody ever been there? Am I by myself in the boat? By my, just me. No, okay, there's a couple of you. But listen, there are seasons when we get into our, our boat with the Lord and we're beginning to go through things where it doesn't make sense. God, I'm on mission for you. I'm, I'm doing this for you. I'm rowing for you. And the wind and the waves begin to overtake. The disciples, some of them were expert fishermen, and they were fearful that they would drown. And so they woke up Jesus, and Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and he, and he says, quiet, be still. And suddenly the wind stops, and a great calm comes over the water. And after this miracle the disciples were overwhelmed, it says, with fear and began to talk amongst themselves, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine being on a boat and somebody stands up, even a, a great preacher or minister or man of God gets up and says, hey, peace be still, and the waves just stop. Just clap down, and it's all flat. And the rain stops. Can you imagine what that would have looked like to the disciples? Can you imagine how amazing it would be to be in that boat at that moment? How scary it was before, but now all of a sudden you realize the guy in the back is in control of the ocean. He's in control of the sky. This is a, a different kind of miracle. This is a different kind of miracle. They'd watched him feed 5,000. They'd watched him uh, multiply loaves and fish. That's pretty cool. Right? That's pretty cool. You got five loaves and a couple of fish. We're going to feed 5,000 people and their families. Let's do this. Yeah, and have 12 baskets of leftovers. How does that work? That's some, that's some Jesus math, okay? <laughs> that's some Jesus math, and, and it's awesome. It's awesome. He, they watched as he reached out and touch a, touches a leper's hand, and the leprosy falls off, and new skin is formed. They had watched all of this, but you know what? Most of this stuff they'd seen before. Or read about in the Old Testament. Prophets had done this stuff. But now this guy talks to the waves. And they obey. This is something different. The question that the disciples ask one another is a vital question for us today. Who is this Jesus? Who is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. The, the disciples had seen him perform miracles at this point, but did they believe that he was the Messiah, the anointed one? Perhaps yes. However, they did not have a concept of a Messiah that would be divine, a Messiah that would have God powers. They were looking for a Messiah that would be a political leader, a king that would, that would bring about God's kingdom through triumph and war. And Jesus shows up and he's more than just a man. He's God. So he's 100% man because he's exhausted and has to sleep but he's 100% God because even the wind and the waves obey him. 
and they are left with this question, who is this? Who is this? I found an interesting scripture this re- week as I was studying this. And uh, it, it, you know, you ever, like you're opening the scripture and you're reading and then you, uh, you come across something and then instantly your mind is like <laughs> blown away. Psalms chapter 107, verse 28 and 29 And I I read this and I was like, wow. It says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper and the waves of the sea were hushed. So this miracle that Jesus did was a fulfillment of this psalm. a a prophetic fulfillment. This had to have been done in order for Jesus to be who he said he would be. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper and the waves of the sea were hushed. The writer of this uh, poetic writing in, in Psalms unknowingly wrote down exactly what the disciples would experience. I never saw that before. But when I read it, I was like, wow. God, you just confirm your word all the time. So pretty cool. Maybe I thought it was cooler than you. Thought that would hit a little harder than it did. My bad. No, God does this. All the time. The second thing that you notice as you read this story is that after Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves, he asked the disciples why they're so afraid and without faith. Now this one has always bugged me. I've always had a hard time with this one. Because sometimes I feel like we should have a little bit more grace in in our experiences because we're not God. But what is revealed here by Jesus is that they didn't trust that he was in control. As followers of Jesus, our faith in God is not merely to trust him for our eternal destination because that's really quite easy. We have no control over when we live or die. So we just blanket put our faith and our trust in Jesus that on on that day when I am when I uh, let go of this earthly vessel and I move into a, a heavenly body that Jesus has got my back and because I am 41 and I probably won't die until I'm in my 70s God willing at least because I have so much time, it's real easy to have faith for 30 years from now. This is really an easy act of faith for me because I believe that Jesus died for me to take away my sins so that I could be with him forever. It's a real easy act of faith because I'm not sitting at the door of death right now. And so in these moments... When we are sitting at the door of death, it tests our our faith. It tests our, our, uh, our countenance. It tests us. But Jesus doesn't merely want to be our fire insurance. He wants to be involved in every storm in your life. He desires to be the answer to every storm in your life and to be present with you in every storm. He wants us to trust him in every storm, not just the big ones. It's not a matter of what 
we're going through. Whether it's a literal storm, but it could be an emotional storm. God want, does not want to be just that fire insurance that keeps you out of hell. He wants to be your ever-present help in times of trouble. He wants to be the tower that you run into. He wants to be the resting place when you're tired. He wants to be that place you go when you need to cry or when you want to laugh. And when the storms rage in life, he wants to be the one you cry out to. When the disciples woke Jesus up to save them, they said something kind of disrespectful. And, and this is what merits Jesus' response. They said, don't you care if we drowned? I mean, you're talking to the God of the universe here. Don't you care if you drowned? Now, I can relate to this because me personally, I respond this way to God sometimes. Don't you see the situation that I'm in? Don't you recognize the difficulty? Are you not paying attention? <laughs> this is the attitude that the disciples have. And also, honestly, it's sometimes the attitude that I have. Can anybody relate to that? Because I'm not a perfect person. I don't have this figured out yet. But I do know that there are moments when things happen where I look up and I say, God, I feel like you're not paying attention to me. I feel like you're not in the middle of what's going on here. And what Jesus is saying is that we need to have faith in him, in the storm. Even though Jesus does not directly answer their question, we know that Jesus indeed cares. He cares so much that to keep us from perishing, he died for us on the cross. Have you fathomed that lately? Have re you really thought about this, that God cares for you enough to die for you. This past week, uh, Grace and I, we were finishing building a uh, cross that's going to go on the front of the church, a backlit cross, and um, and it'll be it'll be bright and it's going to be really cool. Um, but it's pretty big. That's that's her and the dog. The dog helped, and by helping, what I mean is stood in the way a lot. Um, and, uh, and at one point she laid down on the cross and in that moment, as I saw her on the cross, I got a real clear revelation of what Jesus did. Jesus saw our destiny, our destiny to die. And he said, I will take their place. I will go and I will hang on the cross for you. And Jesus tells us, you know, we should take up our cross and follow him. Meaning, we should live for him now that he has died for us. But he chose the nails, he chose the stripes on his back, he chose the whip, he chose the crown because he knew we would face death and he faced the death uh, of, at the hands of men so that the ones that he loved would not have to face death as a dark door. But instead, we could face it knowing of the eternal light that we are stepping into. The Bible has multiple words for love multiple words, but the deepest and strongest bond of love is agape love. And it's a love that is passionate and sacrificial. And it's only used to describe two things in the Bible. And one is a man's love for his wife, uh, a willingness to die for her. 
and God's love for his church. Um, God designed men to be willing to go down in the middle of the night and explore the sound that made a thump that might be an intruder that could harm the family. He designed us to be either brave enough or dumb enough to go down and chase down that sound and put ourselves in harm's way. And that's the type of love that God has for his church. It's a reckless love. It's a, it's a love that is reckless enough to do what is dangerous to ourselves in order to protect what we love. And that's what Jesus did. It's an agape love, a passionate, deep, sacrificial love. Jesus said there's no greater love than this, that a man would da- lay down his life for his friends. almost like to be on that boat, let some of that rain just fly into my mouth and refresh me a little bit there. That's good. No, no, no. No, things will start blowing away. (laughs) When it feels like a storm is crashing on us and about to drown us, we must trust in his love for us. Slide number five. Um, We need to believe that God will do what he said he will do for us. There is a a real neat verse that I find myself quoting all the time. It's in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And I think that this is really, really key when it comes to the storms in our life. And Paul gives us this, and he says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I already got one. I'm good. I'll take it. Yeah, thanks. Now I have extra water. Praise the Lord. Um. So this gives us a proper response to our storm, and it's, it's really very simple. If we'll turn to God in our storm, and the first part of it is just stop being anxious. How do you stop being anxious? The first step, recognize that I'm anxious. Do you know how hard it is to know that you're anxious when you're anxious? It's kind of like... Um, I was working at a mill the other day. I, I went and helped, helped out Corey's workplace, and I, I got a bunch of grease on my face. And I'm walking around for hours with big black grease all over my face, looking around. Nobody else has any grease on their face. But for some reason, I got it. I don't know. I got my hand in it and went like this or something. You know what I'm talking about? And apparently for like five, six hours I've been walking around with this. Nobody says anything. <laughs> Nobody says anything. And, uh, and so then I, I go into the bathroom and I look in the mirror and I look and I've got grease all over my face. And I knew that I felt oily. I knew I felt like kind of sweaty and gross. But I had no idea that I had big black smears on my face. And I've been walking around like this. And, and, and I think sometimes anxiousness is the same way. We can walk around with it for a long time before we ever actually take a moment to reflect. And so sometimes when we're uh, struggling with anxious thoughts or anxious feelings, it's, it's because of something, some external force in our life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a problem at work. Maybe it's a, an issue that you're going through in life. Maybe it's a health concern. And whatever it is, we, we wear it, but we can't see it. And so the challenge is to first recognize that we're in a place 
where we need to stop the anxiousness. And then sometimes it's still hard. But pastor, the waves. But pastor, you haven't seen the checkbook. But pastor, you don't understand the pressure I'm under at work. But pastor, you don't know what it's like. And you're right, I don't. I don't know what it's like to walk in your shoes. But God suffered all things while he was here. Pressures from those around him, misbehavior of others around him, the accusations and abuse and trials and grief of losing loved ones, the cut of being betrayed, the feeling of being alone because someone left you in lurch. You name it, Jesus went through it. And the Bible says that he bore all of our sorrows, all of our stresses on the cross. But pastor, I can't help but feel anxious. What do I do? So glad you asked. Thank you for asking. Gives me an opportunity to talk. But here we are. What do we do? In everything. Everybody say in everything. Okay, it didn't say in some things. It said in everything. In everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So what am I saying? If you're anxious, sometimes it's a good idea to pray. No. In everything. In everything. It is time to pray. And not just any prayers, prayers of supplication. That's a fancy word that says make your requests known. Supplications is just a request to God. God, I've got a storm in my life. God, I'm going through this thing, and it's making me anxious. God, I've got this change. God, I've lost this in my life. God, and we just hold it up. We just hold it up. We lift it up to him. Not just any old way, but with thanksgiving. God already knows the condition of your heart. He already knows the condition of your attitude. He already knows what you're going through. He is in the boat with you, church. He's in the boat with you. He is also catching the waves in his face. If you look at how the disciples approached God, they said, I mean, it's kind of a prayer. Hey, wake up. We're drowned in here. It's a supplication. God, this is my situation. But the attitude is, don't you care I'm going to drown? That's not very thankful. And so if we follow this through and we look at what the disciples could have done and probably got a very different response is, God, I've got a storm in my life right now. God, it feels out of control, but I know you're still God. And thank you that you are God in the storm. Thank you that you are in control. Thank you that I can trust you in this storm. Thank you that you are able to get me through this storm or call it to a calm. Thank you. And all of a sudden, we have a different perspective. 
All of a sudden, if we will pray with supplication and thanksgiving, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, rests on our heart and our mind. There's something beautiful that happens when you're in a storm and you have the faith because that's what Jesus said. He said, don't you have any faith to just go to him in prayer and thanksgiving? There's something miraculous, something beautiful that occurs in our hearts that changes everything. And I'm not telling you that if you go to God this way, that he's going to instantly calm the storm in your life. But I guarantee you, he will help you navigate it. And there's something interesting that happens when we do this. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6, kind of gives us a picture of what this looks like. And I'll kind of close with this. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Catch this in verse 6. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You remember that first video clip that we looked at? We were watching the guy and he's trying to face the storm. Well, when we come into a place where we will pray and seek God's face and ask him, we're pulled out of that place and we get a different view of the storm. Kimmy, will you play that second video clip? You see, all of a sudden, you're on the other side. And up here, it's quiet, and it's still, and there's peace. Jesus wants us to be able to see the storm like he does. And this is how we view the storms in our life, when we know that God is with us, that God is for us, And that God is the God of the storm. Because we are seated high above with him in heavenly places. We get a different view from sitting with Jesus. You see, we no longer realize that the storm is the biggest thing in our life. And we know that the storm is only going to last so long. We know that God is bigger and the storm becomes less and Jesus becomes the God of the storm. In this miracle, when they brought the storm up to Jesus, he spoke to the storm and the waves and he said, peace, be still. And the disciples were in awe and wonder. You see... They knew he could heal the sick. They knew he could multiply the food. They knew he could do amazing things. But when they asked the question, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him, they were realizing that he was more than just a man, that he was God, and he was in control. Jesus did this miracle in the disciples' life for these three reasons, because he loved the disciples God will calm the storms and give you a different perspective when you come to him because he loves you and he wants to be there for you. Secondly, because he wants them to know that he wa- and he wants you to know that he is God. He is the Messiah, the rescuer, and the deliverer. And lastly, because he wants you to know that the kingdom of God is here that things have changed and we're in a new covenant.
today as we close out our service, I'm, I want to pray for people. I want to open up the altars for a time. If you're here today and you're going through a storm in your life and you just want somebody to pray with, if you're here today and you're struggling with your walk with God, you're struggling in any way, I want you to know that you're not alone in the boat. I want you to know that God loves you, he cares for you, and he's here for you. And so I'm just going to close in prayer. We're going to open up the altars. Kimmy, if you could put on some music. Um, and if you're here and you want prayer, please come up. And if you don't, there's coffee in the lobby. So, Father, we thank you that you are God of the storm. We thank you that no matter what it is that we're going through, God, you have been through it. You've been through worse. You've seen it all. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom, Lord God, to be anxious for nothing. And in everything come before you in everything bring our requests to you in everything pray with thanksgiving and father god we know that you'll meet us there we know that you are god and we ask lord um, that every storm in this room every storm within the sound of my voice father that you would speak into it peace be still and I pray, Father, that the, the very peace of God that surpasses understanding would come over the hearts of those that are struggling today. I just thank you, God, that you are here, that you are powerful, that you are the God that we can say even the winds and the waves obey him. And so, Father, be with us as we seek your face as we turn to you. God, I want to thank you for this year that we've had. I want to thank you for the year that's coming. And I believe, God, that you are going to do great and marvelous things. I believe that you are still the God of miracles, that Jesus still does miracles. I believe that you can turn this ship around, that you can do above and beyond what we could ever ask or dream. And so, Father God, as we seek your face this year, I pray that you quiet the storm in our nation, quiet the storm in Washington, Lord God. You quiet the, the storm of racism. You quiet the storm uh, of hate and, and violence, Lord God. You quiet the storms all around this nation. Father, you are the God of the storm. And so, Father, I pray for peace in our nation again. And, Father, justice and mercy, let it flow. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you're either dismissed or called forward. <laughs>